going to turn back to our reading from Luke chapter 22 and 23, perhaps reading in verse 66 of Luke chapter 22. The page number is 1069 in the Church Bibles. Chapter 22, verse 66. This is part of the trial of Jesus. The theme tonight, Jesus, the truth on trial. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Christ, the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me, and if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. The truth on trial, as we think about knowing Jesus tonight, we think about the trial of the Lord Jesus. I've been asked to write uh, another short piece for the Free Church's uh, main website, which will appear in Easter week about the trial of the Lord Jesus. And this is a rich part of the teaching of the Bible about how our Lord Jesus is qualified to be our Savior and our Helper. Every time we celebrate this season of Easter or of Holy Week uh, coming up towards remembering the events of the, the death and the resurrection of Christ, we are being reminded of the greatest act of injustice, of the greatest miscarriage of justice that there has ever been in history. Jesus was condemned in spite of evidence. Jesus was sentenced to die a horrible, lonely, shameful death on a cross with full judicial pomp and ceremony. But he broke no law. He was not guilty of leading a rebellion. He had never committed murder. He had broken no human law, no law of God. And yet, when he was put on trial, after a night of abuse, after he'd been held in the palace of the high priest Caiaphas and had been assaulted physically and assaulted with words and actions of violence. Tell us, prophet, prophesy, who hit you? After a night of being roughed up, he was put on trial, a Jewish trial before the temple authorities, the high priest, and then a trial, a civil trial before the Roman authorities, Pilate, and then because Pilate wanted to palm, palm away this problem to somebody else, he was sent to the jurisdiction of Herod, who was from the Galilee area, who was in town for the Passover. And none of those judges and none of those courts could find evidence against Jesus. Yet they condemned him. That is part of the Easter story. So tonight, the truth on trial. Two things from this section of Luke's gospel. First of all, wicked men placed God's truth on trial. Wicked men placed God's truth on trial. And secondly, human history is littered with injustice. These are the two things that this section testifies to. And it's part of the Easter message that we, human beings, by rejecting God and by rejecting his Son, have put the faithfulness of God and the faithfulness of Jesus, God's Son, on trial. And we have condemned the innocent blood Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But here he is, the way to God, the truth from and about God is 
beaten and accused, and the judges look down on him. The sheer injustice of it all is breathtaking. In John 11, the high priest Caiaphas says that it's expedient to get rid of Jesus. Caiaphas says, in effect, it's better for one man to die than for the whole nation to perish. We may get into trouble with the Romans if Jesus carries on stirring up thousands of people to follow him into the kingdom of God. Pilate uh, was brought in by Caiaphas because Caiaphas had done his sums and Caiaphas had made a calculation. What's the death of one preacher against our security, our temple, our people, the status quo? It made political sense to Caiaphas, the high priest of the Jews, to say, I find this man guilty, and so I'm going to ask the Romans to do my dirty work and get rid of him for me. Now, this uh, event, I want to liken it, the injustice of Caiaphas, I want to liken it to something from the history of the Christian church in the North American continent. Before the American Revolution, there was a great spiritual revival in the British colonies in New England. And one of the people who was greatly used in that was a man called Jonathan Edwards in the 1700s. Jonathan Edwards, around about 1741, he preached a very famous sermon. He preached it in his own church uh, in uh, the state where my son was, uh, in uh, New England. And then he preached it again uh, not just in Northampton, Massachusetts, but he preached it in Enfield in Connecticut as well, and it had a huge impact, especially the second time it was preached. And the title has become legendary. It's probably the most famous sermon title in history. Edwards preached on the title, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He brought home to people the idea that God is a judge and has the right to be a judge, and that if we've fought against him and rebelled against him, then we should see ourselves as in danger of judgment and of eternal punishment in the hands of the God who has every right to be angry with us, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Now, I think it was R.C. Sproul who commented on the story of the trials of Jesus and the rough treatment that he got and said, this is almost the reverse of what Jonathan Edwards talked about. This is more like God falling into the hands of angry sinners. It's so perverse. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is a perfect man. Jesus is a man who has never been selfish or hurt anyone. He has shown care for the sick, for the demonized, for the, the poor. He has shown himself to be concerned for foreigners, for women. He has shown himself to be a remarkable man. And yet, when he came into this world, he was not safe. He was in danger of death at the hands of selfish and wicked and sinful people. So there's the cruelty shown to him through the night as he's assaulted and as he's hurt. The one who is the truth of God is in the hand of sinners, and he's mocked and he's abused and he is led about um, against his will, hit and lied about and insulted. It is appalling. As the night went on, Simon Peter followed Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest's house. And we read in Luke 22 that Peter was warming himself outside while Jesus was being abused and messed with. No doubt the high priest and his associates were discussing how to get him how to nail him, how to deal with him. They spent that night with an interrogation and in abuse, softening Jesus up and in making their plans for how to get rid of him before the Passover itself occurred. 
and before the Sabbath. And Peter was there, and Peter saw some of this going on, and the atmosphere was so threatening. The atmosphere was so horrible, so violent, that Peter, who loved Jesus, Peter, who would die for Jesus, became so afraid that even when a little girl came up to him and said, you were with Jesus, weren't you? He said, no, I don't know the man. He lied about it. He swore about it. Three times he was approached that night, and people said, you're from Galilee. Your, your accent is from Galilee. You, you're one of his followers. You, we've seen you with him. And Peter said, no, 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 I do not know the man. The place had a, a sense of darkness and horror about it. And good on Peter for being there. But Peter couldn't handle it. And we read in, I think it's in verse 61, that the third time he denied Jesus, their eyes locked. The eyes of Jesus looked straight into the eyes of Peter. The Lord turned and looked straight at him. And Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the morning, before the cock crows today, you will disown me three times. And poor Peter was broken, and he went out, and he wept bitterly. He knew that he was intimidated. He knew that he was afraid. He knew that this injustice was something he couldn't handle. But Jesus was being calm, and Jesus was dealing with it, dealing with it, dealing with it all. Abused and mocked, verses 63 to the end of chapter 22, talk about how the people of Israel rejected their own Messiah how he was denied true justice by the temple courts and by the high priest, and then sent on to Pilate and to Herod, the Roman governor. We know from John's Gospel, chapter 18, that in the interview between Herod, uh, between Pilate and, and Jesus, that Pilate at one point, uh, maybe in exasperation, said, what is the truth anyway? What is the truth? Nobody can know what truth is. Truth is Truth is what powerful people decide it is. Uh, History is written by powerful people, and the newspapers are written by powerful people, and facts are determined by powerful people. We will decide what truth is. Not you, Jesus. You're too weak to decide what truth is. We're in power here. We decide that your truth is no good. It's not the truth from God. Rome says what the truth is. The high priest says what the truth is. This court says what the truth is. How wrong Pilate and Herod and Caiaphas were. Truth is truth. They were mocking truth in Christ, abusing truth in Christ, telling lies about truth in Christ. But when they did that, even the people who were paid, who were salaried to come and give lying evidence, could not agree on their stories against him. They contradicted one another. Some said, oh, he said he would destroy the temple. He said his body was the temple and that it would be destroyed by them and that he would rebuild it in three days when he was brought back from the dead. He didn't say he was starting a riot. He didn't say he would use violence. He didn't say the things he was accused by them of saying. But the paid witnesses could not agree. There was no reason to condemn him. The man in the dock was innocent, and Herod couldn't find anything against him, and Pilate declared him to be innocent, repeatedly declared him to be innocent, found that he had not broken any law, he was not worthy of death. Pilate tried to release him. The crowds wanted a murderer, Barabbas, not the innocent man. The innocent man in the dock was God's truth, but he was the truth that this world didn't want to hear and that this world was determined to reject. To make sense of this, it can be helpful to meditate on the prophecies of the Old Testament, especially in the book of Psalms that makes sense of this. Psalm 69, verse 4, and Psalm 22, verses 6 and 7, 14 and 16 to 18. 
give us the prophetic background to the trial and the suffering and the agony and the death of Jesus. Listen to Psalm 69. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. Many are my enemies without cause, those who seek to destroy me. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people in Psalm 22. All who seek me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. More from Psalm 22. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. More from Psalm 22. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. These songs were written centuries before Jesus Messiah was born. Centuries before he came through the Holy Spirit, the prophetic Psalms looked forward to the isolation of the Son, the Son of God, surrounded by human beings who were behaving like animals, who were hitting him and spitting at him and abusing him and mocking him, showing their hatred of him persecution of him. They couldn't wait to kill him and his claim to be the truth of God. Truly, God's truth was on trial. But the second thing we notice tonight is that human history, all of human history since the fall of Adam and Eve, is littered with this kind of injustice. Jesus Christ came into this broken world, unjust world, in order to heal it. And he submitted himself, perfect man that he was, he submitted himself to the rotten justice of this world. And he was judicially executed. He was placed by the authorities of the Jewish people and the authorities of the the civil authorities of Rome. He was sentenced to death, treated as a guilty man. He allowed this to happen because he came into an unjust, wicked world to deal with it and to change it and to absorb the hurt of injustice that is like a sore that never heals running through human history. Bible history is full of this kind of injustice. You think of stories from the Old Testament. Do you remember the story of Naboth's vineyard? A man who had so little, and yet a rich king, Ahab, wanted his vineyard and schemed and lied and did what he had to do to have Naboth killed and to confiscate this little man's little piece of earth so that he could have a vegetable garden near his palace. Human history is full of stories like Naboth's story. But God is a God of justice, and God's Son has come into the world to restore justice to the downtrodden and the likes of Naboth. But the way Jesus did it when he came was to allow himself to be a victim of injustice himself. God's justice came down hard on Jesus in our place, but human justice came down unjustly upon him. He was hated without a cause. Maybe I can give you a 20th century example as well as a biblical example. Not just Naboth, but also in the last 50 years, the story of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Next month, April, will be the anniversary of the, the murder, the assassination of Martin Luther King. Both Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were killed in 1968. And both of them were people who had great promise to do something about injustice, especially racial injustice, in the context of the United States, which is a huge problem with racial tension and racial 
mistrust. It's something that the gospel has something to say about. From the Old Testament and New Testament examples of injustice to modern history, from Naboth to Martin Luther King, our history is bad history. Our history is history of people, often people, imperfect people, but people trying to do the right thing who are punished for it. How many good people who resisted the philosophy of Nazism in the 40s were destroyed. Christians among them who, dis who uh, faced imprisonment and murder because they stood up against the Holocaust or other lies of the, the wicked regime that brought about the Second World War. Now, Christianity must have something to say about the injustice that people experience. It might be because of poverty. It might be because of discrimination, maybe on the basis of race or something like that. Christianity is a message of comfort and hope that says the Savior we ask you to follow was abused. The Savior we ask you to follow was lied about. The Savior we ask you to follow was friendless and alone. He understands you. He understands women who have been the victims of male violence. He understands children who have been uh, subject to horrible abuse. He understands people who have been, uh, because of a, a religious or racial hatred, the target of abuse and cruelty. Now, we don't normally talk about these things, but part of what the Easter story has to say to us in a world that keeps getting justice wrong is that God himself has come down into this world to bring healing and peace and shalom among the nations and between rich and poor and between those with many opportunities and those with few. What a difference it would have made to Iraq if someone who believed in the mission of God to change a broken place like Iraq under Saddam, if someone had come with gospel light and with the fruits of the gospel that transform life, not just with bombs or with force. What a different story there might have been in the last 20 years in the whole world if those with power and influence had said, there's a better way to deal with a dictator in the Middle East than destroying hundreds of thousands of lives. There's a better way to deal with it. But the Arab world will be on fire for a century with seething resentment because people will say, this wasn't just. This wasn't righteous. This wasn't the will of God. And they're right. It wasn't right. And we need to be so gospel aware and so justice aware, so truth aware when we look at the brokenness of people around us. Only salvation through Christ will deal with our deepest and our most eternal needs. But we cannot simply follow a gospel path and say, we care about your soul and your eternal well-being, but we don't care about your circumstances. We don't care about there being no money for schools. We don't care about there being no jobs. We don't care about there being a brokenness in the social care system or the health care system. The Christian faith has to say something about justice denied in the courts and justice denied in the way that the resources of a society are organized and the laws of a society are organized as well. So what are we going to do if humanity is condemned 
in every generation because we are doing all of this. We are doing it. What are we going to do? We face up to the fact that the trial of Jesus is also our trial. And the story of human injustice and bitterness and, and war-making and, and theft is our story. What do we need to do? We need to confess. It's not Jesus who's guilty. We are. It's not Jesus who should be in the dock. We should be in the dock. Pilate should be in the dock, and Caiaphas should be in the dock, and King Herod should be in the dock, but I should be in the dock, and you should be in the dock too. Jesus said this in John 3.18. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world, but human beings loved darkness more than light because their, their lives were full of evil. Our darkness, our sinfulness, is the reason why we have a problem with Jesus being the light of the world. What should we do? Plead guilty. When you read the story of the trial of Jesus, it should convince you not only that he was an innocent man condemned, it should convince you that every other man and woman and child who ever lived is guilty. And that we need to confess that guilt to God and ask for his mercy. What's the message of the, the Easter week? To me, to you, own up to God, I'm a mess without your son. Plead guilty. Enter a guilty plea. I am sorry we put your son on the cross because we're a guilty world. I am sorry that we lied about your son. We're a guilty world. I am sorry we rejected truth and put truth on trial. O oh, judge of all the earth, have mercy on us and show us your perfect justice, not by punishing us for our guilt, but by punishing Jesus in our place. This is the mystery, the mystery of Easter. Richard referred to it in his testimony. I cannot tell why. Why would God in his grace do this? Why would God send his innocent son into a courtroom to be condemned and put on a cross when he wasn't guilty? Why would God do that? We'll never be able to explain or understand the love of God that sent his son, the love of Jesus that willingly went to the cross. The reason Jesus didn't try to get off the, the charge, the reason Jesus didn't defend himself or say, I'm not guilty, Your Honor, the reason he says, yes, I am a king, and yes, I am the Son of God, is that he was on the side of truth, and he was there to die. So for you and me, we enter a guilty plea, but we look to Jesus, our Savior and our judge, and we say, Lord Jesus, you received God's justice at the cross, and justice for you meant mercy for us. Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you. The only response to God putting his Son on trial in the hands of wicked men is our amazing thanksgiving that God would do this. The only response to the injustice and cruelty and sadness of it all is to say, what a wise God, what a wise plan, and what a loving Savior. In my place condemned he stood. Do you know the hymn by Stuart Townend? The one, How Deep the Father's Love. It contains these words. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. I put him there. I put him to his trial. I put him to the cross. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. In the 17th century, there was an artist in Holland, a very great artist, Rembrandt. 
and he painted a scene, the scene of the crucifixion, the raising of the cross, and Rembrandt painted himself in the crowd who were crucifying Christ. A Dutchman at the foot of the cross, implicated in the guilt of it all, he said, it was me who put Jesus on the cross. It was my guilt that put him on the cross. I'm the guilty one. Can you say that? I deserved to be punished. I deserved to be accused. But he took it for me in his great mercy and love. Praise him. Thank him. Love him. Serve him our only possible response to the trial and the death of Jesus is gratitude and faith and worship. Lord Jesus, bless to us your word and help us to see the man taking that beating and that shame put on trial as your truth and our salvation. Amen.